Welcome to the WebMD Health Discovered podcast. I'm Dr. Neha Bartuk, WebMD's Chief Physician Editor for Health and Lifestyle Medicine. Because March is Colorectal Cancer Awareness Month, in today's episode, we wanted to dig in to some concerning trends and talk through the best preventive strategies for colon cancer. But first, some good news. A new study from the American Cancer Society found a 33% decrease in cancer deaths from 1991 to 2021. The only group that didn't see this decrease were middle-aged people. In fact, they found that adults under 50 were the only group to experience an increase in overall cancer incidence compared to people in older age groups. And for adults under 50, colorectal cancer is now the leading cause of cancer death in men and the second leading cause of cancer behind breast cancer in women. The American Cancer Society also reported that nearly double the number of adults under 55 are being diagnosed with colorectal cancer. That's why regular screening starting at age 45 is so important. We know that colon cancer is highly treatable, and in fact, if found early, it can be curable. But many people don't have symptoms in the early stages of colon cancer. So what can we do? How can we prevent colon cancer death and find colon cancer at early enough stages so that it can be cured? Today, we'll take a step-by-step approach to colon cancer, defining what colorectal cancer is, how we can prevent it, and the signs and symptoms we need to look out for. Here to walk us through this topic is my guest, Dr. J.D. Bott. Dr. Bott is a gastroenterologist and physician lead for resource stewardship at the Southeast Permanente Medical Group, Kaiser Permanente, Georgia. But full disclosure, he's also my favorite GI doc because day in and day out, I... And our kids get to watch him provide really just dedicated, compassionate service and care, not just to his patients, but to so many people in our community who just have questions and concerns. So I want to thank you for that. I want to thank you for joining me today. So welcome to the WebMD Health Discovered Podcast, J.D. Thanks for having me back. It's you know, an honor to be on the podcast and congrats to you and your team for producing such a good, informative, great podcast that, that a lot of people are listening to and getting a lot of insight from. Before we jump into our topic for today, I really want to ask you about your own health discovery and particularly around colon cancer, because as we're going to get into There's been a lot of shifts and changes when it comes to trends in colon cancer and colon cancer risk. I'm really curious about your aha moment as it relates to some of these shifting trends and and what it's like to discover someone's colon cancer and have to talk about that with them. Yeah, I mean, I kind of have that aha moment all the time. I just recently, a couple weeks ago, did a colonoscopy on someone asymptomatic first time screening, no symptoms whatsoever, and diagnosed a colon cancer. Luckily, it was early stage and a patient is in the process of getting surgery and was going to do well, but that just highlights the importance of getting early screening and doing it as scheduled. That's really, really helpful. And I think that for us, me and the kids, whenever you're gone, whenever you're at work and you come home and you tell us these stories, it just really imprints on us how important some of these tests are, these screening tools are, because you're literally, this is one of the few cancers where you find it early enough on this screening tool and you can actually just remove it and that person could be cured effectively. So before we get into more about colon cancer, can you just help us understand the anatomy? What is a colon, the rectum? Because when we talk about it, we talk about colorectal cancer, And what functions do these organs serve? Sure, yeah. The colon, it's also called the large intestine. It's the organ that kind of receives digested food from the small intestine. And its main function is to absorb water and electrolytes. So basically, it takes this digested food from the small intestine 
absorbs water and what's remaining is solid waste that we call stool or feces. It's eventually stored in the rectum and then eventually excreted. So that's the main function of the colon. There is some additional digestion that goes on in the colon via the microbiome, which you've probably heard of. Your colon is kind of host to trillions of bacteria, thousands of species of bacteria. And that interaction between the waste matter, these undigestible carbohydrates we call fiber, the interaction between that and all these trillions of bacteria is actually results in the formation of a lot of important compounds, particularly we talk about short-chain fatty acids. And those are really important in terms of regulating metabolism and controlling the inflammation that goes on in the body. So now let's just talk about colon cancer. So essentially the colon is the organ that where stool is kind of being stored. There's all these other components, the microbiome, all of these things sort of interacting. What parts of this process end up putting you at higher risk for colon cancer? How are these colon cancers developing slowly in the colon? Most colon cancers develop from these benign growths in the mucosa or the inner lining of the colon. They're called polyps. So there's many different kinds of polyps, but the ones that we as gastroenterologists are most concerned about when we do a colonoscopy are the polyps called tubular adenomas. These are polyps that harbor abnormal cells. The scientific term for that is dysplasia. Not all tubular adenomas can grow into cancers. About 5 to 10% of tubular adenomas do eventually grow into cancer over many years. But those are the polyps that we're concerned about. Those are the ones that we remove. You know, doing a colonoscopy and, and finding these polyps, removing these polyps, that's where you derive the benefit in terms of reducing colon cancer and reducing colon cancer mortality. Let's talk about some of the trends because some of these trends are really concerning, particularly when we're thinking about young people being diagnosed. And by that, I mean people younger than 50. That's really sort of a group where colon cancer incidence seems to be growing. And it's really concerning because you have some people in their 20s and 30s that are being diagnosed with colon cancer. So tell us about some of the trends. What should we know about colon cancer risk? Colon cancer overall is the third most common cancer diagnosed in both men and women. We know that it accounts for the second most cancer deaths every year. But we know that it's preventable with screening techniques, and it's often curable if it's found early. We know that there's about a 4% lifetime risk of developing colon cancer in both men and women. But we know that over the last 25 to 30 years, there's been a significant increase in the risk of colon cancer in younger people. So if you compare people born after 1990 to people born around the time of 1950 or so, there's a two-fold higher risk of colon cancer. There's a four-fold risk of, of rectal cancer. So it's quite significant, and, and that's led the various screening bodies to, to lower the age of screening to 45 from 50. Why th is this happening? We don't really know. We think that it could have something to do with diets that are higher in processed foods, that are lower in fiber, higher in red meat, a sedentary lifestyle, obesity, things like that. Now, could there be other environmental factors? You've spent a lot of time talking about how the environment impacts health. Could that have something to do with exposures? Something in the environment, are we ingesting things that, that we weren't 50 years ago? That's quite possible. So you hit some of my questions that I was going to ask about. So is there some difference in gender that we need to be thinking about? Certainly there's newer trends where we're concerned about it and in younger people than you were concerned about it before. So you talked about the fact that as many, many different bodies are recommending earlier screening. So screening starting at 45. So can you talk a little bit about what does that mean? Are we talking about colonoscopies starting at 45? Are we talking about the stool cards that people talk about? And what are some of the differences? So start with colonoscopies and then kind of talk about stool cards and the different types of stool cards. 
I mean, there are different modalities. You know, as a gastroenterologist, the one I do the most is colonoscopy. That's a procedure whereby which we have patients clean out their colon. They come in, they're usually sedated, and then we put a small fiber optic scope into the colon and we look for polyps. We look for cancers. We look for other other things as well. But the thing that we're highlighting in terms of when we do it as a screening test, we're looking for polyps and potentially cancers. If we do find polyps, there's various ways that we can remove those. And we do do that. Generally, 95% of the polyps we see on a colonoscopy, they can be removed endoscopically. There are other forms of screening. There's stool-based testing. The one that's a little bit older is something called FIT or fecal immunochemical test. And that's a test that's performed every year. There's another newer one. It's FIT plus a stool DNA test. So what it does is it analyzes your stool for actually fragments of DNA that could be concerning for cancer. So this is DNA that's shed from cancer harboring cells. So the one that people have heard of the most is Cologuard. So that's the FIT plus stool DNA test. So that one is done every three years. Generally, they're all pretty good. I mean, colonoscopy is the best in terms of detecting cancer plus polyps. But, you know, the, the FIT test, if it's done annually, the Cologar test, if it's done every three years, is pretty darn good in terms of detection for colon cancer detection. It's not a, as good for polyps. But we say the best screening test is the one that you're actually going to do. So there are people in kind of resource poor settings or in rural environments that may not have ready access to a colonoscopy or someone doing a colonoscopy. So we, we recommend do the test that you're actually going to willfully do and that's available to you. Is this something that people should be talking to their primary care doctor about as well, starting at 45? So if they're finding that it's really hard to get in to see a gastroenterologist, really talking through with your primary care doctor, I want to get fit tested. I need to do that every year. Is that something they should really be talking about with their primary care doctors? Absolutely. You know, I mean, there are questions that patients are going to have. There's specific things that they may be concerned about with a colonoscopy. Of course, there are some risks to a colonoscopy. Most people do want some form of sedation, so there's kind of inherent risks with that. And then there's questions on how to handle your stool for a stool-based test. So these are all questions that can obviously be answered by a gastroenterologist, but can certainly be answered by a primary care doctor as well. So that's, it's that kind of shared decision-making process that's, that's really important when you're choosing the right modality of screening for you. So just tell us, because I recognized and I heard you use a very kind and nice euphemism, which is we ask you to clean out your bowels, but we know what that means. So you're going to have to take this very intense sort of protocol of various medicines that you drink that can sometimes for some people just be really scary. So can you talk us through what preparing for a colonoscopy might look like? And then also, what's the actual process for doing the stool carts? Sure. I'll start with colonoscopy. So usually, yes, you do have to do a prep, and that's probably the most kind of onerous part of the procedure. That's the one that patients remember the most. The day of is usually pretty relaxed. You come in, you get an IV placed, you get sedated, and before you know it, the procedure's done, and you're in a very relaxed kind of mood because of the anesthesia. But the day before, it does involve being on a clear liquid diet, so no solid foods. There's various laxatives we give, but the one that's most commonly given is this four liter solution. Half of it's consumed the night before, and then half of it's consumed the morning of the procedure. And that's what gets you to go. You're going to have a lot of bowel movements, but you know that part of the procedure is so important because if you come in and you don't have a well-prepped colon, we're not going to be able to detect as much as we could if it was a clean colon. So that's actually a very important part of the colonoscopy. In terms of the stool-based testing, it's essentially, yeah, you're handling your stool. So some people may be a little bit queasy dealing with their stool. The, the fit test generally is just sampling the stool. So you can actually sample it from your toilet paper. The Cologuard is actually you have to capture your entire stool and submit a sample of your stool 
in a kit. But the convenience of this, it can be done at home. Usually these kits can be mailed to the patient's house. They don't, doesn't have to be picked up and uh, it can be done at the convenience of your house and then sent back to a lab for analysis. Okay. That's really helpful in terms of just talking through the different types of screening tools and the reality of what each of these might look like for you. I'd like to kind of shift the conversation now to the next step, which is say you're having symptoms before you're due for screening. So screening, just to, again, be so clear, completely clear. Screening just means you have no symptoms. When do you kind of really need to be thinking about worrying signs or symptoms where you go into your doctor to say, I need some sort of evaluation that happens regardless of whether or not you meet the criteria for screening colonoscopy. Right. Yeah. I mean, you're absolutely right. Screening is generally considered to be someone's asymptomatic. They're essentially being screened for the disease. They don't have symptoms that are concerning for the disease, right? So again, yeah, start at age 45. For most average risk people, screening, it should be done every 10 years. If you have a family history, that may change. And then the stool-based testing, if it's a fit, it's every year. If it's the colobar, it's every three years. Now, you're talking about someone with symptoms, right? So, you know, it's hard to tease out. I mean, the best thing is to have a conversation with your primary care doctor or see a gastroenterologist if you are having symptoms that you're concerned about. A lot of it may be just reassurance, but some of these symptoms may be concerning and may need evaluation with a colonoscopy or imaging or labs. So the things that kind of raise an eyebrow for me is persistent. I think having a conversation with your primary care doctor or gastroenterologist can help determine whether testing needs to be done. But things that may be concerning is persistent blood in the stool, things like weight loss, persistent abdominal pain, change in your bowel movements in terms of the consistency or the frequency. These are things that are they're worth actually having a conversation about and may warrant more testing. And I'm curious about how you've changed your approach, because I know that when we were in training and in medical school, it really was something that you think about and you're concerned about later in life. It's something that you think about if you have other conditions like inflammatory bowel disease, that kind of maybe raises more of a red flag. But how have you changed your approach to maybe having a lower threshold for doing a colonoscopy? Or have you? Have you always sort of been like, if someone comes in with such and such symptom, colonoscopy is just something I'm going to have to do? Can you talk us through your thought process? I think the statistics that we talked about earlier have kind of moved me to be more aware of the fact that, hey, colon cancer is a significant possibility in someone that may be younger than what you expect colon cancer to kind of present in. So it just makes you a little bit more aware. I mean, you still have to take each situation individually and you have to assess the persistence. For instance, blood in the stool, is it persistent? What is the frequency in which it's happening? Is it quite a bit of blood? You can check their labs. Are they anemic? Are they iron deficient? These are all things that are going to be more concerning for a process like potentially cancer causing those symptoms. So it's hard to kind of say, this is when you should have a colonoscopy and this is when you shouldn't. It's really where you have to kind of individualize the situation and it depends on the context. Let's talk through lifestyle changes. Like what would you recommend for somebody else? What should we be doing better in our lives? Now we don't know the exact mechanisms of how diet and obesity and sedentary lifestyle could contribute to the actual cancer pathway, but we know that it is correlated. It is associated. So I think just adhering to a healthy lifestyle, regular exercise, being mindful of your weight, being mindful of what you're eating and trying to stick to foods that are high in fiber, that are more plant-based, that are less intake of red meat. Those are things that I think have a significant impact on your colon health. Also probiotics. So we talked a little bit about the microbiota. Your colon is host to trillions of bacteria. 
giving your colon kind of this continuous infusion of good bacteria is important. You can get that naturally through yogurt, fermented foods like kimchi and kefir. These are all things that have a lot of natural probiotic in them. Of course, there's there's so many kind of probiotic pills on the market, but I'm a proponent of kind of getting probiotics naturally. And that kind of interaction between the prebiotics or the fiber that your colon is exposed to and the probiotics that the colon harbors, it produces so many good compounds that that are really, really in- integral to your gut immunity in terms of reducing kind of systemic inflammation, in terms of making sure the integrity of your gut is good. And these are all things that will lead to potentially less cancer and other things that we're finding out about the microbiome. Does it have an effect on cardiovascular health, on inflammation, on various other things? So my take home point is, yes, it's important what you eat. The other things that we were thinking about, you talk about a lot, are just other lifestyle things like smoking and other risks potentially for colon cancer. So can you talk a little bit about that? Smoking is definitely a big risk factor. We know that there's a lot of evidence that smoking is a big risk factor for not just colon cancer, but many kinds of cancers. We know that family history has something to do with it. So if you do have a first degree relative that had colon cancer, particularly a relative under the age of 60 that had colon cancer, you should be screened earlier. And you may need a increased frequency by which you're screened as well. So for instance, in terms of colonoscopy, if you had a first degree relative that was diagnosed at the age of 55, you should actually start your screening at 40 instead of 45 and do it every five years. So we know those are the two big risk factors that have a a lot of evidence tied behind it. So we've talked about colon cancer rates being on the rise. We've talked about colonoscopy and stool testing for colon cancer screening. But I'd love to get your thoughts on this new trial, this new clinical trial that was published recently in the New England Journal of Medicine. And the focus there was on a blood-based screening test that seems to be pretty promising. I'd love you to just help us understand what is that blood-based test testing for when screening for colon cancer? And then I'll ask you a couple of other questions. Yeah, it's it's kind of cool that we're recording this right after this trial published. So it published in the New England Journal of Medicine a couple of weeks ago. And it's, it is pretty promising. It's, it's pretty cool. I mean, there are some highlights and some things that should be noted about the test. It's basically a cell-free DNA test. So it's a blood-based test that tests for strands of aberrant DNA that could be in your blood if you're harboring a colon cancer. It was developed by Garden Health, which is a uh, biotech company based out of California. And, you know, the short story is it's a pretty good test. In terms of effectiveness, it's pretty similar to the stool-based test, to tell you the truth. Its sensitivity is very similar to particularly Cologuard. Not so good for pre-malignant polyps or pre-malignant lesions. So same kind of limitations as stool-based tests. The kicker here is it's a blood-based test, right? So in terms of uptake and compliance and convenience and efficiency, it may be something that's going to be more enthusiastically, you're going to have more patient participation in this kind of test, we think, than something that requires inspection of your stool, collection of your stool, mailing a kit in. Those are steps that are limitations in terms of overall patient adherence. So that's really interesting. So what I'm hearing you say is essentially that this blood test is looking for the types of DNA that you would find if you had a colon cancer, but you're not necessarily going to be able to see these lesions, polyps, things that are precancerous. And so in certain instances, having a screening colonoscopy is actually going to help you not only with screening, but also preventing some of those polyps that might be high risk to turn into colon cancer, but haven't yet. I think it's also really interesting that it seems pretty effective or similarly effective to some of the stool-based tests. So that's really something interesting from the primary care standpoint. When I offer patients colon cancer screening, and it just definitely feels like 
this is something that is doable in the primary care setting as well. So that's great. My question then to follow up is if you do decide to go the route of this blood-based test, how frequently would you need to be screened? The manufacturer did suggest, if you look at the paper and the discussion section, it does suggest every three years. So that's probably going to have to be teased out with some more prospective trials, validation trials, things like that. But it's, it's probably going to be every three years. So, you know, as we kind of discussed earlier in the podcast, a screening test is only as good as patient participation, how adherent your patients are going to be to the test. So if you have a really, really accurate test, but not many people participating in it, it's not a great test. This has about an 87% sensitivity for colon cancer. Cologuard in comparison is about 94%. Fit testing is about 70%. Colonoscopy is obviously the gold standard, but the most onerous of all of these tests is a colonoscopy. Of course, that's something you're going to need if you do have a positive blood test or if you have a positive stool test. That's going to be the end result. But in terms of a screening test, it can be pretty difficult. And as we talked about also, if you're in a setting that's resource poor, or it's in a rural area, it may be very difficult. So, you know, this is a really exciting kind of tool. It's another tool that we're going to have in our toolbox. And our goal is to have 80% of people screened for colon cancer nationally in the next, I don't know what the goal is exactly, 10 years or so, we're not doing a good job. They looked at this, they decreased the age to 45 a few years ago. Only about 59% of people of eligible screening age actually get screened with one of these tests. So we have a long way to go. And this is another tool that we can use to accomplish that goal. And last question. So when do you think that this test is going to be ready for prime time? So it's not FDA approved yet. Any sense of when we might expect this tool to be in our toolkit? The hearing for the actual test is this week. I think I read the 28th. So, you know, I don't know if that's final approval or if it's preliminary, but it, it's going to be approved soon, it sounds like. And then in terms of getting it to market and getting it across the country to labs where it's accessible for patients to actually get, it's probably going to take some time. So I think, you know, this is a important and exciting test to come out. There could be some potential limitations to it, I, and I think I should point them out. First of all, it's a pretty effective test. It's not quite as good as some of the things we already have out, particularly Cologuard and colonoscopy. The other big limitation could be that it could be quite expensive. And it's unclear whether insurances will cover it, at least initially. So I think for the short term, you know, the primary options that I would promote would still be colonoscopy and or stool-based testing. But this is definitely something that has some promise and could be really, really useful down the line. So I'm going to give you the last few minutes to close the episode with a bite-sized action items that can empower our listeners to create a sustainable change that's going to help them with reducing their risk for colon cancer or helping them to identify it early? I mean, my take-home point is, as we mentioned before, eating a well-balanced diet, try to make it mostly plant-based, eat a lot of fiber, try to take in a lot of probiotics naturally, kind of a natural source of probiotics. And then get screened early. That's the point of screening. You don't know that you potentially could have polyps or you could be harboring a cancer. So just following the guidelines, starting at age 45, do the screening test that is going to be the most appealing to you that's going to fit into your lifestyle, be it a stool-based test or a colonoscopy, and have those conversations. Don't be afraid to have the conversation with your primary care doctor, or if you want to see a gastroenterologist to talk about it, that's totally appropriate as well. Thank you so much for being with us today. We've talked with my husband, Dr. J.D. Bott, about colon cancer risk, some of the concerning trends, and things that we can do in our everyday lives to reduce our risks, like starting with eliminating potentially processed foods from your diet, and then really thinking about where you fit in with colon cancer screening guidelines, choosing the right tool for you, and not letting concerning symptoms go. Talking to your health professional right away if there's any concerning symptoms, and then making a decision together about what the next steps need to be. To find out more information about Dr. Bot, visit our show notes. 
Thank you so much for listening. Please take a moment to follow, rate, and review this podcast on your favorite listening platform. If you'd like to send me an email about topics you're interested in or questions for future guests, please send me a note at webmdpodcast at webmd.net. This is Dr. Neha Bhattat for the WebMD Health Discovered Podcast. <laughs>